Hello, and welcome to lesson eight of my filmmaking terms and analysis unit. This lesson will be talking all about continuity editing. I want to start with a question. When an editor cuts from one shot to another shot, what types of things do you expect to stay the same between the two shots to create the illusion of continuous action between the two shots? What do you expect to be the same in shot A and shot B? Look at these examples. You can see how in the first example, Ray's hand is outstretched. And in the second shot, the other opposite hand is outstretched. In the first shot, her right arm is stretched out. And in the second shot, her left arm is stretched out. The audience might not notice this, but this is an error in continuity. There was a mistake made between the cut, between the two shots that were recorded, and perhaps the editor had no other footage to work with. So continuity is important on set when recording so that the editor can create the illusion of continuous action from shot to shot. So the position of the actor's body is important between those two shots. Look at the example of Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz in the middle. You can see that in the first shot, shot A, her hair is longer, and in the second shot, shot B, her hair is shorter. Her pigtails magically change size in between shots, and this is a mistake in continuity. So it breaks the illusion of continuous action, when in reality, obviously between these two shots, Dorothy's hair or her wig was shortened or cut in between the two recordings. So perhaps they were recorded on different days, and the people in charge of Dorothy's costume decided to shorten her hair, but they weren't done with this scene. So the two shots, one with long hair, one with short hair, don't really go together. This is a mistake in continuity editing, also known as a continuity error. Look at the example from Harry Potter. In the first shot, Hermione is on one side of the table while Harry Potter is on the other side of the table. But in the second shot, they're both on the same side of the table. This is a mistake in blocking. So the blocking of the characters changed in between shots, and no one realized that this would mess up the continuity. By the time it got to the editor, the editor had no choice but to combine these two shots. So all three of these are examples of continuity errors. Again, the first one is an error in the actor's body position or body language. The second is a mistake in the costume, changing from shot to shot. And the third is a mistake in blocking. The position of the actors within the scene is disrupted in between shots. So your vocabulary for today will be going into the editing document. So open up your editing document and we'll begin adding vocabulary with the first term, continuity editing. Continuity editing is creating the illusion of seamlessness between the edits. Seamlessness meaning there's no visible seam or no visible cut. Practicing continuity means that your editing will be almost invisible to the audience. Of course, an audience knows that a video editor cuts from shot to shot, but it will be less noticeable and they will be more drawn into the story and less distracted if you maintain continuity throughout the film. Continuity editing is the practice of creating that seamless illusion between shots. Time, space, and subjects will seem uninterrupted. Actions should flow smoothly from shot to shot. This is also known as invisible editing. In the top left example, you can see the general position of the character's heads is matched in the shot reverse shot conversation scene. In the top middle example, you can see that the general position of the woman's fists is matched with the cut between a medium shot and a close-up shot. In the top right example, you can see that the sword fight scene is hard to match, but you need to match the position of general sword positions in between shots. It's important for actors to repeat the same actions the same way every time you record a scene from a different angle. So in a fight scene, if you want to be able to cut from one shot to another seamlessly, smoothly, and visibly, you'll need to have the actors act out the exact same motions more than one time. In the bottom left example, you can see the cut from the master shot to the close-up requires the actor's facial expression to match from shot to shot. In the bottom middle example, you can see that the editor 
shooter uses an insert shot of the gun to switch between these three shots. If he only had the first two shots, it might seem jarring to go from a wider shot to a closer shot, but that insert shot smooths out the transition between shot A and shot C by inserting shot B. In the bottom right example, you can see an example of shot reverse shot that uses an action. The action of shooting the gun and then the reaction of the hat flying off of Clint Eastwood's head. So we've talked about shots already, and I hinted in the lesson where I introduced the term shot that we would later move on to something that's a little bit longer. A piece that is built from multiple shots, and that is our next term, a scene. A scene is the action that takes place in a certain place and time in the story. It's kind of like a chapter in a book. Scenes usually consist of multiple shots edited together. You can see in both of these examples that shot reverse shot is used to stitch these shots together to build a scene. We haven't talked about shot reverse shot yet, but we'll get to that vocab term very soon. Our next term is coverage. When a director says that they want to get a lot of coverage of a scene, what they're saying is they want to get many different camera angles and shot sizes so that the editor has a lot of footage to work with. Coverage is the amount of footage that is shot. It's all of the different shot sizes and camera angles used to cover the scene. It's everything that the editor has to work with to build the scene. When gathering coverage, it's important that two shots from different angles aren't too similar. Make sure that the different angles are different enough, that the shot sizes are different enough so that the cuts don't feel jarring. You don't want two shots that are similar but slightly off, or it will seem like a mistake on the tripod on the part of the camera operator. You wanna make sure that when gathering coverage, you're getting very different angles and shot sizes for the editor to change position throughout the scene. When an editor is going to build their scene, a very common way to begin is with an establishing shot. That's our next vocab term. Again, an establishing shot is classically the first shot of a scene. An establishing shot is designed to show the audience where the scene is set. Establishing shots can work even if the actors aren't really there. For example, the top left example outside of a drugstore could be used to set up a location, but then the interior could have been recorded at any place that looks kind of like a drugstore, and our brains would connect the exterior to the interior. The establishing shot establishes where we are. This is commonly used when films are shot in a different location than where the story is set. For example, if a film is shot in Canada, but it is set in New York, you can record exterior shots for the establishing shots to establish the location of New York and fool your audience into thinking that the actors are actually there. The top middle example of the police station is a classic example. Police stations aren't going to allow filmmakers to film because police can't afford to give up the police station for a day for you to film your film. So if you want to set something in a police station, whether you're an indie filmmaker or a professional filmmaker, you're going to record an exterior establishing shot of a real police station and then recreate a police station environment interior somewhere else. That will fool your audience into thinking that they're in a real police station when in fact they're on a set. Establishing shots are very common in sitcoms as you can see in the bottom middle and bottom right example. Oftentimes you'll see the exterior of the family's home before we see the scene set inside of the family's home. Sometimes you see that home every time you come back from commercial just to remind you where we are. Establishing shots are often used for environments to show us where a character is going. In the top right example, the characters are outside, so this establishing shot is letting us know where they are in the world. The bottom left is also a good example of an establishing shot locating us out in the public. Next up, the editor is often going to go to the master shot. The master shot is a very important shot to get because the editor can always go back to the master shot. The master shot is a shot that is long enough to fit all of the important action within the frame. It's a long shot containing all of the important elements of the scene. Classically, filmmakers go to this shot first. When making films, there's often the problem of running out of time, so filmmakers will classically go to this shot first. If you record the master shot 
first and then go to record other coverage, you know at least you got the master shot. At least you got a shot that contains all of the important elements. This shot for the editor is a good fallback lifesaver shot. You can always go back to the master shot if the close-ups are revealing something you don't want to show to the audience, like a character accidentally looking at the camera, or a character making a weird facial expression. Or maybe you just want to show a different shot that's the same camera angle, a close-up of a character. Maybe Maybe they did a great job on their first line, but did a bad job on their second line, and you want to use a different take, a different try at that line. You can go from the first line close up to the master shot and then back to the second line close up from a different take. This way you can stitch together those pieces. You don't want to rely on only close ups, only mediums. You want to make sure that you get the master shot because that's going to hold the whole scene together and it's going to be a backup plan if some of of the close-ups aren't so great. The next few terms that we're going to explore are very simple. It's just a quick way to refer to a shot based on how many people are in the shot. The first term is the two shot. A two shot is simply a shot of two people together. Similarly, if you add a third person, it could be called a three shot. If there's more than three people, you could call it a group shot. Of course, you can still use sizes and angles to refer to these shots, but an editor might quickly refer to these shots as two shots, three shots, and master shots instead of by their sizes. Because an editor is using the shots for the intended purpose of showing action. So a two shot is going to show the action between these two characters. A single is a shot of just one actor. So add this new term to your list. Actors themselves will often refer to close-ups of themselves as singles because the camera is primarily focused on them. So it's very important for them to know when the shot is a single, they are the main subject, the only subject really in the shot. A single is considered clean if there's nothing cluttering the foreground, and it's considered dirty if there are objects closer to the camera before you see the actor's face. An example of putting objects in the foreground is the over-the-shoulder shot. So our next term is over-the-shoulder. An over-the-shoulder shot is a shot that shows part of a character, maybe their shoulder, maybe their neck or head head or all three together in the frame closer to the camera than the subject whose face is being shown. Again, this could be part of their shoulder, part of their head, but it's always referred to as an over-the-shoulder shot, an OTS. You can see that the rule of thirds applies especially in an over-the-shoulder shot. You want to make sure that you're not leaving a bunch of space on the sides of the frame. You want to put your characters off center so that one character is on the left part of the frame, and one character is more to the right part of the frame. An important part of continuity editing is the concept of eyeline matching. You don't want to cut two shots together with characters looking in the same direction if they're supposed to be looking at each other. Otherwise, if I'm looking right, and then you cut to another character looking right, it won't look like we're having a conversation. It will look like we're looking away at the same thing. And if that's not your intended purpose, then you need to remind yourself about eyeline matching. Not only is it the direction left or right, but where they're looking on the side of the frame is also important to make sure that the shots match. You can see that these two shots match exactly. So it looks like the characters are looking directly into each other's eyes when you cut from one shot to the other. Again, eyeline matching is used to create the illusion that characters are looking at each other. It can also be used to match the character's eyeline to an object that they're looking at. So if they're looking at something off screen, you want to make sure that their eyeline matches with the next shot that you get of the object that they're looking at. And that brings us to a term that I've mentioned a couple times already, shot reverse shot. This is a very important concept for you to understand. Shot reverse shot is an editing pattern that's used to connect two shots to each other. It's used to cut from a person speaking to the person they're speaking to, or to cut from a person looking to what they're looking at. It requires accurate eyeline matching. Again, 
in order for your editor to create a shot reverse shot, your director and cinematographer and actors have to cooperate to create eyeline matching in between shots. So if you are a director, you want to make sure you're directing your actors to create an eyeline match. You want to look at the frame that your cinematographer is creating and direct your actors based on the previous shots. This is something that you want to keep in mind constantly when filming dialogue scenes to ensure that your characters appear to be having conversations with each other between shots instead of looking off in different directions. In the left example, you can see a classic example of eyeline matching. The characters are looking in opposite directions, but they appear to be looking toward each other, matching the eye lines between the two shots as the editor cuts between those shots. We, as an audience, understand that they're looking at each other. In the middle black and white example, you can see this is a little bit more complicated. When the eye lines are angled, they should still be opposite. So one character is looking up and to the right, while another character is looking down and to the left but their eye lines will match up when editing because of that opposite look toward each other's direction. In the top right example of the woman looking at the painting, this is a little bit easier to understand. We're about to look dead on straight at a painting. So the woman is looking slightly off camera, not right into the lens, but slightly off of the lens. And then the editor cuts to an insert shot of the object she's looking at. In the example on the right from Fargo of the man and woman in the office talking to each other, they're looking just off camera, not right into the camera. The man is looking slightly to the right side of the camera, and the woman is looking slightly to the left side of the camera. The opposite looks, but both looking toward the camera as the editor cuts. The man is positioned on the left side of the frame, looking to the right. The woman is positioned on the right right side of the frame looking to the left, and then the editor is able to combine these shots together in shot reverse shot. In the bottom right example from Psycho, you can see the woman look down and then the insert shot of what she's looking at, which is on a couch lower than she is. Again, the direction that the character is looking is important so that the shot matches with the future shot keep in mind where your shots will connect as a director because your editor needs you to think about it. Another thing a director should think about for the editor's sake is the 180 degree rule. Most of the time you want to follow this rule to create the illusion of continuity. It could be continuity of movement or for your conversation scenes to help you understand eyeline matching. You want to basically picture everything as a flat screen, even though you're working in a 3D space. What's the left side of the frame? What's the right side of the frame? And you don't want to accidentally flip the screen. The 180 degree rule is very important for shot reverse shot. It's going to ensure that your characters stay on the correct side of the screen. Please think about it. If your characters are sitting at a table opposite each other, and you start on one side of the table with character A on the left and character B on the right, but then end up on the other side of the table, what will happen? It will be a mirror image. Your camera is now on the other side of the table. Character B is on the left. Character A is now on the right. So if the editor tries to combine shots between the two camera positions, they won't work. Character A will be looking to the right in the first set of shots, and character B will be looking to the right in the second set of shots, and if you try to combine them, they're both looking in the same direction. So 180 degree rule is very important, and these diagrams hopefully will help you understand it. In the bottom left example, you can see the two characters at a table example. The camera can only go on one side of the table. You can position the camera in many different ways to get close-ups and over-the-shoulder shots and master shots, but you can't go on the other side of the table without breaking the 180 degree degree rule and risking a very difficult job for your editor. In the middle example, you can see that the 180 degree rule is simply applied to character movement. If one character is moving forward, then you want to make sure you stay on that line of their movement. You don't want it to suddenly look like they're turning around and going in the opposite direction. And that's what will happen if you move the camera on the other side of that character's movement. And in the third diagram, again, we see that conversation scene. This rule is extremely 
extremely important for conversation scenes, and it gets a little bit more complicated when you add a third character, or a fourth character, or a fifth character. Basically, you're creating multiple lines throughout the conversation. As the direction of the conversation changes, that line will change. As the direction of character movement changes, that line will change. You want your camera operator to constantly keep that in mind. Yes, they want to get all over the place and get all kinds of cool shots, but they need to remember that this movie is going to end up on a screen, and the editor is going to have to handle how these shots connect to each other. So even though we're working in a 3D environment, we have to remember it's going to end up on a two-dimensional screen. Eyeline and character movement needs to continue in the same direction in a scene unless there's a reason for it to change, to be disrupted, and then you need to readjust. Where's the new line of action? This line of the 180 degree rule, that red line you see in the middle example, is called the action line. So you need to establish the action line where your camera can be placed behind that line and not go beyond that line. And whenever the action changes into a new direction, you need to reestablish that action line, continually noting where that limitation is going to be for your camera so that you don't flip the direction of your character's action, the direction your character is looking. Remember, we're working with a screen, and the way you position your camera is going to determine which direction your character is looking and which direction your characters are moving. So shot reverse shot and the 180 degree rule are very important for both the camera operator, the director, and the editor to understand. Next up we have the idea of a cutaway shot and this is a great tool for the editor to keep in mind. A cutaway shot is when you cut away from the main action to show something that's not a part of the main action. We might still hear the characters but we see something else and it's a great band-aid to place on top of a mistake or a problem or to simply connect shots that weren't connecting so well. A cutaway is an interruption of a continuously filmed action with a view view of something separate from the main action. Again, these cutaway shots can be used to solve problems with continuity or to add more meaning to a scene. It's a great tool for an editor to understand, and it's important that your cinematographer gets enough coverage to allow this to happen. That means not just filming the actors, but also filming the environment. Reaction shots are a type of cutaway that does use an actor. It's a shot which cuts to a reaction of a character in the scene. This can emphasize the emotion of a scene, and it can also be used to cover up a mistake of the main actor who's speaking. So while that actor's speaking, if you want to switch shots, but you can't because it's the same size and angle, then you can use a reaction shot in between those shots to connect the audio with that reaction shot. The audio will sound continuous between two sentences, when you cut on the break between the two sentences. But the visual needs to be interrupted briefly with a reaction shot to connect two different shots from the same camera angle. Reaction shots can be a great way for the actors to perform with facial expression. When I think of a cutaway, I often think of the insert shot. An insert shot is a cutaway shot that cuts away to show a specific detail. This specific detail should add information to the scene. It should emphasize an idea Idea or convey a tone. So reaction shots and insert shots are two different kinds of cutaways that your editor might use throughout a scene to help connect things together. Another way your editor will connect things together besides shot reverse shot and cutaway shots is with match on action. This is such an important concept for directors and for editors to understand. A director needs to direct actors to repeat the same physical movements throughout different shots so that they can connect. And an editor needs to find where they connect, where the actor's body position connects between shots. Shots. Match on action is a cut between two shots that show the same continuous action. The action seems uninterrupted because the cut is made on the exact same or very similar body positions. This is also known as cutting on action. The fact that the character is in the middle of a movement makes the cut less noticeable. We're locked onto the character and since their movement continues into the next shot, it doesn't feel like any time has passed. It feels like one continuous action. In the top left example, Jim Carrey swivels around and then swivels around again and with those 
those body swivels, we see a cut. In the top middle example, Morpheus turns around, and when he turns around, we see that cut, and his physical movement matches between shots. In the top right example, as Leonardo DiCaprio enters the doorway, that threshold, his body's position within the threshold is moving forward into the house. The coverage of that movement is capturing him from three different positions, and the editor is cutting to make sure that his general body position within the doorway is similar from shots to shot as he moves in, in, and in further. There's a match on action in the bottom left when the grenade pin is being pulled. The cut is actually made as soon as the hand is ready to pull, and then in the next shot, the pin is pulled from the grenade. The second example on the bottom left from The Shining, where Jack Nicholson is throwing an axe into the door, is a great example of match on action. There's fluid movement with an axe being thrown forward. If it suddenly was forward and then back with no arching movement in between shots, the audience would notice it. The editor has to be careful to make sure there's continuous motion between shots. In the third example on the bottom, the character reaches for something and then we see their hand on the thing that they're reaching for. Amateur filmmakers make the mistake again and again of accidentally showing the hand reach out twice when a character goes to grab something. You want to see the character reach out for it and then you want to see them finish grabbing it. You don't want to see their hand move out twice in a row from different angles. The audience will understand subconsciously that that's a mistake. The action should be continuous. Reach and then grab, not reach and then reach. In the bottom right example, you can see the continuous match on action through the doorway again. In this example, a character pushes a door open and the door continues to open. The door's position is generally in the same position in between the cuts. You need to make sure you don't see a door open twice when you go from inside to outside. That's it for the vocabulary on continuity editing. Now it's your chance to practice some continuity editing. My students are going to be given some footage that I've shot of a conversation. I've created two different characters sitting at opposite sides of the table, and I've shot it with maximum coverage. I shot a master shot with every line of dialogue, two over-the-shoulder shots with every line of dialogue, two close-up singles with every line of dialogue, one from an angular point of view and one from a POV point of view looking toward the camera. And I've shot profile shots of both characters, seeing every line of dialogue from every position of the camera. You can see a diagram here of this triangular form of shooting coverage, where I'm staying on one side of the 180 degree action line, and I'm creating as many possible shots as I can to create maximum coverage. Again, there's a master shot, of course, two over the shoulders, two point of views, two angular singles, and two profile shots. All nine of these shots together are being used to build a dialogue scene with enough dialogue, enough lines of dialogue, that the editor can switch between every single camera angle. If you are not one of my students, I challenge you to shoot a scene this way and then try editing it together. But for my students, since I'm providing the footage to you, today is your chance to be the editor who edits these shots together. Now, I have an important rule about this project. You can use the shots in whatever order you would like. However, you need to match the matching pairs together in shot reverse shot. The best examples of shot reverse shot match similar angles and sizes. I want you to start and end with the master shot, but in between those two pieces, shot reverse shot. For example, if you choose to use a POV of character A, you need to then cut to a POV of character B. POV of character A, POV of character B. Maybe you want to start with the profile of character A. Start with profile of character A and cut to profile of character B. Maybe you want to start with the over the shoulder of character A. Start with the over the shoulder of character A and cut to the over the shoulder of character B. Maybe you want to start with a angular single of character A. Start with an angular single of character A and then cut to an angular single of character B. Do you see what I'm saying here? Match the matching pairs together in shot reverse shot, going through every different shot type and then returning finally to the master shot. Again, I want you to start with the master shot and end with the master shot. I want you to use every single type of shot that I have gathered for coverage in this triangular shooting method using the 180 degree rule. I want you to use all nine shots 
start with the master shot, end with the master shot, and pair up every other type of shot, going from one character speaking to the other character as they reply with their line of dialogue, back and forth between the different types of shots until you have run out of different types of shots, and then I want you to return finally to the master shot. Get creative, but don't mix them all up. Don't cut from an angular single to a POV to a profile shot to an over-the-shoulder shot and mix them all together. Cut between the pairs of of shots. So if we look at this diagram, this would be an example of how to do it. Go from the master shot, then show angular singles of one character, then the other, then profile shots of one character, and then the other, then over the shoulder shots of one character, and then the other, and then POV singles of one character, and then the other. Finally, return to the master shot. This would be a simple example, but the order of the pairs is up to you. You can choose them based on the best deliveries of the dialogue. Oftentimes, an editor is looking for the best way that an actor set a line and the way that their face looked and they're trying to find that that perfect shot that captures the line of dialogue really well and that's, that's what they're looking for oftentimes they'll go through all the footage and just mark the best shots but you want to make sure that in the end you're using shot reverse shot throughout the edit cutting from one similar shot to another similar shot of the two different characters so that their eye lines match together again match each pair of shots back to back, use shot reverse shot, POV to POV, over the shoulder to over the shoulder, and use every shot in matching pairs. At the beginning, put the master shot, and at the end, put the master shot. My students can find this project on wevideo.com. It's been shared with you as the maximum coverage dialogue scene. And others who are not my students, I would encourage you to try recording a scene like this and then editing it together. Thanks for watching lesson eight on continuity editing. Next lesson, we'll talk more about editing. I'll see you then.